Hello, Christ Chapel. No matter uh, where you are, which venue you're in, thank you for joining us and being a part of the Christ Chapel family. And would everyone take a copy of the scriptures and open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. If you're opening one of the blue Bibles in uh, one of our venues, it's page 948, 948. Uh, if you don't have a, a copy of the scriptures and would like one, Jen and I would love to buy you a copy of the scriptures yourself. So uh, just let me know. We'd love to buy you a Bible. Merry Christmas. It'd be a great Christmas gift. We'd love to do that uh, for you. While you're getting settled and opening your Bibles and uh, get out those sermon notes too, uh, one of the things that may have fallen out is this envelope, end of year giving. And I just want to talk about that uh, very quickly. Um, first of all, uh, thank you so much for uh, the way that you responded. Uh, we talked about giving as far, part of uh, a habit of discipleship. 74 of you took that next step and set up reoccurring gifts. Thank you for doing that. That's awesome. Praise God. Uh, this is uh, just an end of year gift that we talk about uh, a special opportunity for you to give. And we talk about making room for people in need. Uh, that, where that tagline kind of came from, I was thinking about the Christmas story. And I uh, was thinking about the person that said to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, there's no room in the inn. I'm like, man, that dude missed out. You know, like he missed out on a really good opportunity. And so we want to make room for folks in need. And so first, it, that means at the South Campus, we need to continue to expand the South Campus uh, to make room for the next generation. That includes children and student space. Uh, the second one is in our community, uh, creating housing for missions and ministry. We have five residential lots here at the Fort Worth campus uh, that we need to uh, build on so that we can have uh, those needs met for ministry and missions. And then uh, the, the third one is in El Salvador. We have a great church partner that is reaching all of South America through their church in El Salvador, and they need a permanent church home. And so uh, many of our student ministries have gone there and visited. Our family mission trips go there as well. So uh, it's, a very, uh, uh, it's a great partner near and dear to our hearts. And so uh, the reason why we've given you an envelope there is not because that's the only way you can give to the end of year uh, initiatives, but also you can do that online. Uh, but this is just a physical thing. It's just probably me. You guys know I'm old school. But uh, this is just a tangible thing where I can put this in my Bible and every day just pray and say, Lord, how would you want to lead me? It's just a, a visible reminder to me. And that's all that we ask that you do. Um, is that you would just pray and ask God, God, how do you want me to participate? And then just obey, just do whatever he uh, leads you to do. So this, that's what I'm gonna do. Take this, put it someplace where you can see it and just pray and ask God how you, he might have you participate uh, to make room for those in need uh, this, at the end of this year, okay? Uh, we are continuing our series today uh, in light of Christ as we uh, we'll finish out uh, Romans, and if you'll remember, this is all about uh, kind of, we, we're applying what God has taught us in Romans chapter 1 uh, through 11. Uh, we're applying it in uh, chapters 12 through 16. So in light of all that God has done, considering all that he's done in Jesus, here's how we should respond. And we've talked specifically about relationships. That's where he's picked up here in chapter 12. And we use those ideas of concentric circles. So we started with those who are inside of our walls, those who are outside of our walls, and today we get the fun one, the government. So it's going to be a blast. So get, get ready here, guys. Uh, but we're going to talk about government. Last, last week when we talked about getting along with those outside of our walls, if you'll remember, I used that analogy of DTRing, defining the relationship. And uh, because it's important to define a relationship, and I wanted to do that today with the government, not because I need to explain what the government is, those lines are, are pretty bright, but just to highlight the fact of that we have to have the right expectations of the government. We have to have the right expectations of oh, what are they supposed to do and what are they not supposed to do and how therefore can we expect them to step into our lives or not step into our lives, et cetera, et cetera. And the best place to get clarity on those kinds of expectations is in God's word. And so what I would like to do is just read verses one through seven. And so if you'll just follow along, we'll do exactly what we've done the past two weeks. We'll read it as a whole before we go back and break it down. So Romans chapter 13, uh, we're gonna read verses one through seven. Follow along, please. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except 
from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing. Verse 7, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. And we're going to stop right there today. May God bless the reading of his word. May our hearts be open to hear from him. Now, I know that just by reading those verses, uh, many of you are already struggling. And uh, that's okay. That's all right. Um, There are a couple reasons why I'm pretty certain that you're struggling as we read this passage. And one is because uh, you are a red-blooded sinner. And you don't like authority. And, And none of us like authority as sinners. And that tale is as old as time. Uh, Adam and Eve didn't like authority. God told them what to do, and they said, nope, we think we can do something different. And so that goes all the way back. And so part of the reason why your blood pressure is rising is, is in a sense, not your fault. You've inherited the sin nature. But because you're a red-blooded sinner, you don't like authority, and so you don't like this passage. Uh, The the other reason why you don't like this is because you're a red-blooded American, most likely. And if you think about it, Our entire country and our patriotism is built off of rebellion against authority. You do know that, right? I mean, it it was, we don't like that government, and so we're going to rebel and do our own thing. And you're like, yes, that's the American spirit. Maybe so, but not the Christian one. And that's what we have to untangle as we wrestle with this passage. Because what we do believe at Christ Chapel in regard to this passage and every other passage is, we believe that the word of God is inspired by God, is inerrant, and is authoritative for our lives. And and I feel like we need to just sit there for just a second, okay? Okay. Because we've got, to, we've got to approach this from that theological foundation. That we do believe that what God says, the Bible says, and what the Bible says, God says. This is inerrant. This is authoritative for our lives. Okay? Anybody going to amen that one? Okay. No, no, I, I get it. I get it. It's hard. It's hard. But we're not going to cut out the pieces of the Bible that are hard. We're, we're, we're going to wrestle with them because God gave them for our instruction and for our, our good. And so that's, what we ha- that's the, the part that we have to uh, really start with that foundation about what we believe about the word of God. And because we believe it's inerrant, inspired, and authoritative for our lives, it is therefore transcendent. Meaning that this passage applies no matter which country you're in, no matter which political party is in office, no matter who is president or in any office. This is transcendent. And you say, hold on, Cody, I think we, I think we should be able to, to rebel in some ways, and you wouldn't use the word rebel, but that's what you mean. But we should rebel in some way. Hold on. You gotta think about one more thing before we jump into the passage. Because if there was ever an exception to the rule for this passage, wouldn't it have been the Romans? The Romans that Paul is writing to is what I mean. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't they have been the ones that could go, surely you don't mean this to us. I mean, we are sitting under one of the cruelest empires of the time, even though they're calling what they're doing Pax Romana, you know, the, the piece of Rome that they're spreading throughout the world. But Nero is in power. 
when this is written in the mid, you know, it's about 55-ish A.D., so, so Nero is in power, Christians are marginalized, and they're persecuted. They're about to be thrown into all of those coliseums, into the carnival games, where the carnival game is kill the Christian. That, that's what's about to happen to them by the government. And yet Paul is writing to this to them in Romans 13. And so if there was ever an exception, I think it would have been them, yet... God inspires Paul to record this in his letter to write to the Romans. This is, this is hard stuff for your head and your heart. I totally understand that. And so we're going to have to go back through it and walk back through it because we do believe that God's word applies to you and to me today. So how so? Why is God telling us to relate to the government in this way? So I'd like to go through and talk about what the government's role is and how we are called to respond so that we live in light of Christ in relationship to the government. So uh, this is where your outline will start here. But the first thing I want you to see is that the government is an authority instituted by God. The government is an authority instituted by God. Now, before we talk about that, I I, I do want to say it's not the only authority instituted by God. There are three institutions that that God has established. Uh, The first one is the family. First one is the family. Second one is the church. The third one is the government. So those, those three institutions ordained by God are distinct, and they each have their own role to play in God's design, plan, and purpose. The family being for relationship, the church being for redemption, and the government being for rule of law. So there are three separate institutions that all have a purpose in God's design. So I just, I don't have time to go into how those all function uh, together, but um, they, they cannot overstep the bounds, but they are uh, related in, in certain ways. Uh, but the government is an authority that's instituted by God, and this is what uh, Paul says back in verse 1. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by him. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed. God has appointed. This is why I use that word uh, instituted and and authority. And when you talk about um, what our role is, he says, let everyone. Now, that means sinner and saint. That, that means Christian and non-Christian. It means everybody should be subject. Why? Because everybody is a sinner. Every, everybody has a sin nature that wants to uh, rebel, and there's a part of this that is constraining the sin nature in a sense. And so that, that's why he says, let everyone be subject to. That, that literally means submit, which no one wants to hear that word. But that's what, we're, that's what we're called to do. He said, submit to the governing authorities. And I, th- I want to explain that just very quickly too, because I think oftentimes when we, when we read this passage or think about this passage, we have, uh, when we talk about the governing authorities, each of you probably has a face that comes to mind. And you go, I I am not submitting to that person. Hold on. Governing authorities doesn't just mean one person. It doesn't just mean the president, or it doesn't just mean the president and the vice president. This is the governing authorities. This is the the police. This is the, the military. These are federal officials. These are judges and civil servants and all of those that have been put in place for our good. And when we, when we think about it in, in that sense, I would hope that you would obey the governing authorities. I hope you stop at a red light. People's lives depend on that. 
Now that is a governing authority that someone has put in place for your good. And so we've got to broaden the context here and not just make it so myopically focused on this one person or persons or party or whatever, whatever that is. Think about it holistically because that's how he has it in mind here is submit to the governing authorities. Now, some of you are saying, hold on, Cody, what if the government isn't godly? What if it's not godly? Do we have to submit to it then? First, there has never been a godly government on the face of this earth. So you're going to be waiting a long time if you're waiting for that. Um, Second, God has used pagan, ungodly governments for his purpose for thousands of years. God can use all of those things, all of those people, all of those governing authorities for his purpose. Read your Old Testament. Read your Old Testament. And, and you will see God explicitly saying that to his, through the prophets to his people of, hey, I'm going to let the Assyrians come in and take you over because you are not getting it. Or I'm going to let the Babylonians come in and they're going to exile you because you're not paying attention. You, I, I've got to do something here to get your attention. And, and the same is true here in Romans. Guys, remember where we started in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, God, we don't want your ways. And he goes, fine, I'll give you over to your own desires. You want to go that way? Here you go. And remember why he does that. Acts chapter 17, and we studied this. This will come up on the screen. And we studied this when we went through the book of Acts uh, just a couple years ago. But Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. And he made from one many every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Why? That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of them. One of the things I I, I wanna say, and I wrote this down and shared this with the sermon note team um, as I was praying through preparing this, and some of you, this is a phrase that you need to sit with and you need to meditate on this week. But your Christian growth is not contingent or conditional on a godly government. Let me say that again. Your Christian growth is not conditional, is not contingent on a godly government. And if you need proof of that, that is the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament, again, I just told you the context of Romans. Romans, the Christians are marginalized, they're thrown into coliseums, they're killed, they're persecuted, and what does the gospel do? It not only endures, but it spreads. And you see these people on fire, and and, and it gives disciples so much peace that God is in control, even of the governing authorities, that you have disciples of Jesus falling asleep in prison when prison doors are open. And they're like, eh, I'm good. This is radical stuff, radical stuff that we believe that God is in control. And so don't buy the lie that you need a godly government in order to grow in your Christ-likeness. That's not not biblical, okay? That's why, just, just to be clear, so... Being subject to the governing authorities is not um, in conflict with you growing in Christ or submitting your life to him or submitting to the government because it is an institute that God, it's an authority that has been instituted by God. Second, the government is an instrument empowered by God. It's an instrument empowered by God. If the, if the government is instituted 
by God, then um, he empowers it to fulfill his design, his purpose, his role that he wants them to play in our world uh, today. So if you look back at verse 2, the second part of verse 2 through 4, it says, And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what's good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And so in order to keep the rule of law... He essentially gives the government what it says, the sword, which definitely there was capital punishment back in that day, but you can even broaden it to the sense of this is the teeth behind the law, that there will be consequences if you don't obey the law. Now, the punishment should fit the crime. And that has always been God's intent. Even if you look back into the Old Testament law, look back at Leviticus 24, it, it talks about an eye for an eye. Now, now that is, does not mean that there can't be forgiveness, but it was so that the, the punishment would not exceed the crime, so that they would be proportionate uh, to. So he didn't want people to, to go too far uh, with that. So he says, the, the government has been empowered. They, they carry the sword to punish the wrongdoer. This is why. So that people don't continue to do evil in our society. Hey, let's put a stop to that. There need to be consequences. The, the law carries the, the sword, which is what he, he says here. And so there are a couple of different motives when we talk about obedience to the law. Now, if, if uh, you are not a Christ follower, I pray that you would place your faith in Jesus Christ as the only way to eternal life. But if you're not a Christ follower, then you should obey the government so you don't get punished. I mean, that, that, there's a practical reason or motivation to obey. Uh, you don't want to be behind bars. That, that totally makes sense, and everybody understands that and gets that. That sounds logical. But the other reason why, as a Christ follower, follower is a spiritual reason and that is because you believe that God has instituted that authority and you should therefore obey that authority so it's practical and it's spiritual two reasons and motivations to obey now let me address because some of you have been here since moment one of this sermon when should you resist when should I rebel, Cody? Okay, let's, let's talk about those times specifically uh, in the Bible when people rebelled against uh, the government because there are three explicit times. The first one is in Exodus chapter one. In Exodus chapter one, Pharaoh tells the Hebrew midwives to kill all of the male Hebrew children who are born and the Hebrew wives say, or the Hebrew midwives say no. They, they don't obey the command to murder, okay? So that, that's one. And by the way, we will be studying Exodus all next year. So just a sneak peek. I'm excited about it. It'll be really good. So, um, so that, that's the exception one to, to resist. Uh, the second one, uh, Daniel chapter six. Daniel chapter six, Darius uh, signs this into decree and he does this because he's tricked into it because people are jealous of Daniel and they, they say, hey, don't let anybody worship anybody else. And Daniel's like, I can't worship God? Um, sorry, I'm going to have to do that. And so he worships God and goes against it. And man, it's really, go back and read Daniel six because Darius hates that he has to throw Daniel into the lion's den, hates it. And he's like, oh, please pray to your God that things are gonna go okay with you. It's amazing what what happens. But but the resistance is about worship. So don't murder, okay? That was the the first one, that that murder the kids. No, I'm not gonna do that. Don't worship God. Well, sorry, I have to worship God. And the next one is in Acts chapter five when uh, Peter is preaching the gospel and they bring him in and they say, don't preach the gospel. And he's like, 
okay, sorry, dude. Um, he says, I have to obey God rather than men, okay? Now, don't take that phrase and apply it wherever you want because those are the, those are the three explicit exceptions to resist the government. So if the government tells you to kill, don't do it. If they tell you you can't worship God, you worship God. If they tell you you can't preach the gospel, you resist and you go preach the gospel. So let's be really careful about where we think we are the exception to the rule or our circumstances are an exception to the rule because the exceptions biblically are in obvious and and direct opposition to God's will for our lives. If if it's that clear, then okay, resist. But really, the government is an instrument that is empowered to restrain evil. That's why he instituted them into society to punish those evildoers. And so if if you're gonna resist, one, know what the commands of God are so that you can understand if they're in opposition, but also, and I just have to say this, when we talk about resisting, be willing to accept the consequences. Daniel was willing to go into the lion's den. Okay, and we, we just had prayer for the persecuted church. There, so many wonderful folks are, are resisting in those biblical ways. They're preaching the gospel even though they're, they're told not to, and they're like, ah, I have to obey God rather than men, and they're willing to accept those consequences. And praise God for that. And their faith is growing. And people are coming to Christ. I mean, it's amazing things that are happening through that, being obedient to God uh, first and foremost. Okay, so the the government is an authority instituted by God, an instrument empowered by God. And then finally, the government is a servant accountable to God. Is a servant accountable to God. Where... God grants or gives power or authority, he will always hold those folks accountable. There will be a day of reckoning. And, and I mean that for every, every authority that, that we mentioned, whether that's family, whether that's church, whether that's government. All, all of those will be held accountable. And we can all think of examples in those different spheres where people have abused that power. And that is absolutely tragic. That is not the reason why God gave that person uh, authority or power or anything like that. That is sinful. That is evil. That is tragic. Uh, and that person will give an account to God. Absolutely 100%. Uh, so those folks are accountable to God. But just because of those instances, I don't think that that means that those institutions need to be uh, ignored or done away with. I think they need to be reformed. There needs, those, there, there needs to be a, a change, a, a change of, of heart and, and sometimes what brings that change of heart is knowing that there are consequences or teeth to uh, those kinds of things. And sometimes it comes from simply knowing that you will have to give an account to God. And that's what he says here is the government is a servant of God and will give an account, verses 5 through 7. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience which we're going to come back to that word because it's an interesting uh, thought. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And so the way that Paul describes Uh, the government, if you look back at the word that he uses in verse uh, um, 6, it's actually a word that that literally just means a a servant of a king. But if you go back when when Paul is describing how the government is a a minister, as it says here, a minister of God, back in verse 4, it uses the same word that we use for deacons. 
Now, deacons are freaking out right now. Um, they're like, oh, no, don't see me that way. Don't put me in that light. You're good, deacons. Um, but my, my point is, it's a role instituted by God to serve a particular purpose for his people, and therefore, we will be held accountable to God for how we carry that out. And that's what he's saying here. These, these folks will be accountable to God for serving his people, how, how they do that. And so, therefore, he says, you are to be in subjection to them. They are accountable to me. And you are accountable for how you obey me. You're not in control of them. We talked about this this last week. You can't control how folks will respond. But you can control how you will obey. And he's saying here, submit yourselves to those who are to be servants of mine. And he says, in order to do that, give them what they are due. And one of those things that they are due are your resources. He says, give them taxes. Pay your taxes. And now you, you might be, this is, this is the red-blooded American part of you that says, Cody, I'm not paying. No taxation without representation. We were taught this in school. You were, and that was rebellion. That was, that was rebellious. You do know that Christians in Rome were being taxed without representation, Right? There was Caesar, and then there was everybody else. He didn't care what anybody else said. So they were, he, and, and, and Paul still says, pay your taxes. He still says, give them the resources they need to fulfill the role that I have called them to in your land. So he says, pay them what, what you owe them. Pay them taxes. Um, second thing, he says, give them your respect. Give them your respect. Uh, man, talk about chapping people's hide last week. Th- that chaps some of your hides now. I, I get it. But let me tell you where to begin. I, I, I think you need to begin with, with prayer. Uh, Paul tells, tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, pray for your leaders. And, and I really believe that the more we pray for people, uh, the more our heart softens toward them. Uh, folks who serve in the civil government in our government, it's a hard role. And, it, and if, you're, if you are serving in that way in, in our city, in our counties, in our state, in our country, thank you for your service to us. Thank you. I know you're slogging it out, trying to do the best that you can. I know you're taking arrows that were never meant for you. I'm sorry. That's hard. That is really hard. Thank you for trying to honor God with the way that you serve. I, I appreciate that. And I know you probably don't get a lot of appreciation for that. And we need to give respect to those offices because those offices are instituted by God, by, by God to, to do good for you, for, for you. And so honor those folks. And again, remember the broad umbrella. Honor those folks that are judges. Honor those folks that are uh, the police uh, men and women who are serving in our city. Honor those people who uh, help get water and electricity to us and those kinds of things. Like, thank God for those people. Thank you. Let's give respect to, to those folks. Now, some of you got stuck on that word conscience. You say, but Cody, what if my conscience says that I shouldn't? Well, first, don't always trust your conscience. You need a spirit-led conscience. That, that, that's really important. Uh, don't fly solo on your own conscience. And, and the conscience that he's mentioning here it is, is not the uh, quiver in your liver per se. What, what it is, is he's talking about if you break the law, you're breaking your conscience is what he's saying here. And for your conscience sake, so that your conscience isn't seared or dulled, obey the law. That's what he's talking about with the conscience here in this context. And so let's be careful about using our conscience as an out in order to resist or rebel or be the exception to the rule. Okay? 
So let me tie this up uh, for you as quick as I can. Okay, to get along with the government, uh, we have to see ourselves in light of Christ and be a Christian citizen. Be a Christian citizen. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul tells us, he says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have to see ourselves with our, every, every day we wake up, we pledge allegiance to Jesus. We, we are, our, our citizenship belongs there. And even the way that Paul talks about us, are ambassadors for Christ. And if you are an ambassador in a foreign land, you have an allegiance first and foremost to your, your country that you came from or to your country where you will return. That, that's how he sees us and that's how we have to see ourselves as Christian citizens. And so let me, let me break it down about what that means and give you some, some applications here. Uh, first, it means submit your hope to a sovereign king as a kingdom citizen. You are a kingdom citizen. So submit your hope to a sovereign king. Sometimes I think that we put too much hope in the law of the land rather than the Lord. And if you think, Cody, but if we got every law changed and it was every law pointed to the holiness of God, then we would be good. That's called the Old Testament. Where there were 613 laws that pointed to the holiness of God and it still didn't work. Why? Because it was governing sinners like you and me. Because we want to rebel. We, we will buck authority. We, we don't want to be in submission. And so that's why God has to change the equation. He changes the equation and says, you know what? The, I, I spelled it out so clearly that I gave you 613 laws about how to live so that you could get along with me and everyone else and everyone outside of your walls, and you couldn't do it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to give you a new heart. It's the only way this is going to change is to give you a heart that obeys, to give you a heart that submits, to give you a heart that sees that I'm in control of all these things because you're not gonna get it if you just try to follow the law. You're not gonna get it. And we have to remember that our hope is in God changing one heart at a time. Change the law and don't change somebody's heart and it won't do any good. That's why our role as a church, remember the institution of the church, our role is redemption, to go and preach the gospel so that people would submit their hearts and lives to God first and foremost and live as kingdom citizens first and foremost. That's where our hope lies, is in what Jesus can do. So submit your hope first and foremost to a sovereign king as a kingdom citizen. A second, submit your conduct to God-ordained authorities as law-abiding citizens. Submit your conduct to God-ordained authorities as law-abiding citizens. As Christians, we should be shining examples of citizens of our land. Remember, that's, that's how, you, you look back at those, those folks that I talked, I mean, Joseph, I mean, what a shining example. The dude, the dude was falsely accused and thrown into prison, and he, God still uses him in these amazing ways, so much so that he's promoted to second in command in Egypt. Uh, uh, Daniel, I just gave you that example in Daniel chapter 6. He's thrown into the lion's den, and Darius is going, please don't die. I, 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 want, I want you as a part of my administration because he's shining examples of, hey, I am going to submit as far as I can to the laws of the land. We should be shining examples of that. But, but let me say this. Submission to authorities does not equal silence. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Uh, participate. 
vote. Do, do those things in the allowances of the government in ways that God leads and calls you to in a God-honoring way that shows that you believe that God is ultimately in control, but you're still going to participate because those folks participated. Daniel participated. Joseph participated. These folks did participate in the laws of the land, and, and you can and should too, but first and foremost as a kingdom citizen. Okay, and then finally, submit your priorities to spirit-led conduct as a dual citizen. Submit your priorities to spirit-led conduct as a dual citizen. This is that dual citizenship. Uh, the vast majority of you are Americans, but if you're a Christ follower, you're a kingdom citizen first and foremost. And so you have to, you have to put his priorities first and foremost, but in order to, to do that and understand how do I live in, in a foreign land when I am a citizen of another kingdom, it has to be spirit-led, it has to be informed by the word, it has to be uh, in Christian community that we're all going, dude, I think you're out of bounds on that one. Where, where we can speak into each other's lives, where we can hold each other accountable, but we prioritize kingdom citizen first. And here's the kicker. When you prioritize being a kingdom citizen first, you believe that God is ultimately in control. Do you believe that? Do you? Th that is the ultimate sticking point of this whole passage, is do you believe that God is ultimately in control? Because when you take matters into your own hands, you're saying, God, you're not in control. You're not powerful enough. You're not good. You don't have a plan. This is out of control, and I need to take it into my own hands. And that's where the rub comes. God is in control. Don't forget Acts chapter 17, that he set the boundaries and the times of all those things. Why? So that we and everyone else would seek him, even though he is not far off. Let me pray for us. God, I'm reminded of the worship song that we've sung many times in all of our venues, that we trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. And it's really, it's really hard sometimes it's really hard to see that, that you reign above all things, that you're in control. So Lord God, would you anchor us uh, in your word to see that even when things didn't go people's ways, even when it seemed like people's backs were against the wall, you always came through. Your purposes always prevailed. Lord, would we put our hope and our confidence in you and would you lead our, our hearts and our minds to be not only influenced by the Spirit, but to be led by the Spirit so that we can live out the peace of Christ in our own lives and therefore share that hope with those around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.